I've always thought of climate change as being caused by a, a, a special form of air pollution and to understand why it works and why it is such a threat to us, we need to really focus on the atmosphere itself, Earth's atmosphere, and try to understand how that works because Earth's atmosphere is one of the most extraordinary elements of this planet and its relationship with life is very profound. Our atmosphere is extraordinarily dynamic. I think that's the first thing we need to know. So pollution, air pollution that's generated here uh, in India within a matter of months will spread globally. Likewise, pollution we produce in Australia will spread globally. That means that there's a common human responsibility for dealing with this problem. Air pollution, particularly for the long-lived pollutants that last more than a couple of months in the atmosphere, is not a matter for individual nations alone but has to be dealt with by humanity as a whole. The atmosphere is also particularly vulnerable to pollution by virtue of its size. And in order to understand how big the atmosphere is, we need to carry out a bit of a thought experiment. The reason is that, of course, if you look up into the sky, the atmosphere looks very large. It looks like it goes on forever and ever. And that's profoundly misleading. In order to comprehend the size of the atmosphere, we need to imagine taking the gases that comprise our atmosphere and compressing them a thousand times or so until they become a liquid. If we could imagine doing that and then putting that volume of liquid in some giant celestial flask and comparing it with the volume of the oceans, of the liquids in the oceans, we would be able to see very clearly that the atmosphere is 500 times smaller than the oceans. And that is a fundamental fact to know about our atmosphere, because the smaller a receptacle for pollution, the more vulnerable it is to a given amount of pollutant. Over my lifetime of 53 years, I haven't seen a single global oceanic pollution crisis. In fact, there hasn't been one ever caused by humans. It's not that us humans are kind to the seas by, uh, by any uh, uh, fact. It is just that the oceans are large enough to be forgiving, relatively forgiving, of the very large amounts of pollutants that we have been feeding into them over the years. However, in my 53 years on this planet, I've lived through three separate global or near-global atmospheric pollution crises. That's simply a result of the small size of the atmosphere and the large influence of humanity on that relatively small atmosphere. The first of those crises manifested itself in the 1970s when people noticed across parts of uh, Europe and North America that forests were dying, lakes were becoming clear and devoid of life, sterile, soils were being damaged. And they discovered fairly quickly that this was being caused by sulphur, which was being emitted from coal-fired power plants and other sources of fossil fuel combustion. The sulphur was going up the smokestacks of the power plants, combining with moisture in the atmosphere and falling to our, uh, the surface of the earth as sulfuric acid. And that sulfuric acid was literally scalding the life out of the areas that it fell upon. People acted fairly quickly when they understood the nature of that problem. Some governments mandated a shift to low sulphur fuels. Others mandated the installation of sulphur scrubbers to stop the sulphur getting out of the smokestack and into the atmosphere. And a very, very bright man, a man called Richard Sandor, an economist from America, realised that one way of dealing with the problem was allowing people to, to trade in the right to pollute with sulphur. He set up something called a sulphur trading scheme in Chicago. That scheme has now gone on to be the progenitor of many carbon trading schemes that we see around the world. It was spectacularly successful in dealing with the sulphur problem. Uh, how successful it will be in dealing with the climate problem and the carbon problem is yet to be seen. But nevertheless, with, those, with that basket of approaches, at least the developed nations uh, relatively swiftly solved the acid rain problem. By the mid-1980s, however, we, I suppose we should have been celebrating our success and triumphing over this 
what, what I would call a near global atmospheric pollution crisis. And I should just clarify that the reason it wasn't a global pollution crisis is that sulphur is relatively short lived in the air. If there's any moisture at all in the air, it tends to fall out within a matter of hours or at most a couple of days. And so there just isn't enough time for winds to blow the sulphur around the world, making it a truly global problem. By the mid 1980s, however, as that problem was starting to decline, a new atmospheric pollution crisis uh, rose its head. <clears throat> that was manifested as a decline in the concentration of ozone over the Antarctic. And at the time that those measurements demonstrating the decline of ozone uh, were being taken, uh, we didn't know at all what was causing the problem. We didn't even know whether the measurements were real. Initially, the, uh, the scientists taking the measurements thought that perhaps they were recording this decline due to faulty instrumentation. Perhaps the very extreme temperatures in the Antarctic were interfering with their delicate instruments. Turned out that wasn't the case. And a couple of years later, uh, a group of American, or predominantly American uh, uh, geochemists uh, understood that the problem was caused by a particular chemical that was being manufactured by humans, uh, a group of chemicals called CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons, and that these chlorofluorocarbons, while they were harmless at the surface of our planet, uh, as they rose up through the atmosphere and got into the upper atmosphere, were starting to destroy ozone because up there they broke down, chlorine atoms were released, and the chlor a single chlorine atom in the stratosphere above our heads can destroy many thousands of ozone molecules. This was truly alarming news because without ozone, we simply wouldn't have life on Earth as we know it today. Uh, the ozone layer, it only comprises six parts per million of this atmosphere of ours, but it is absolutely essential as a sunscreen for humanity. If there was no ozone in the atmosphere, um, well, I should just say that the ozone layer scrubs out most of the ultraviolet radiation that would otherwise reach the surface of our planet. In the absence, about 97 to 99%, that is, um, in the absence of ozone, we would have a, a massive bombardment of ultraviolet radiation to the surface of our planet, and that would be very damaging for life on Earth. Just to give you a, a rough indication of what life might be like, uh, in Australia in summer, if I was foolish enough to go to the beach without a hat or sunscreen or, and other such protections, I'd probably get a pretty bad sun, sunburn in 20 minutes. In the absence of ozone, I'd get that same sort of sunburn in a matter of seconds. You know, so it's a very important uh, protective element of our planet. Crops are damaged with increased ultraviolet radiation. Life in the oceans is damaged. Anything with eyes suffers increased incidence of blindness. So this was a great threat. On the 16th of October 1987, the nations of the world got together to combat this threat in Montreal, Canada. And together we signed the first effective global treaty, really, to ban a substance that was immediately threatening human existence. The Montreal Protocol seemed to have passed without terribly much fanfare globally. I believe that one day humanity will recognise it as one of the greatest achievements of our times. It was the first time we all got together as a species to combat a threat. Today we tend to celebrate national days. I know you've had one here just in India on the 26th of January. We had Australia Day on the same day. Let's hope that one day uh, we as a species will celebrate Montreal Protocol Day, the day we came together for the benefit of all humanity. In that year, however, that we first moved to combating the second uh, very dangerous air pollution threat, a third threat raised its head. Heat waves were felt in the United States and scientists were brought into the American Congress to testify as to why these heat waves were occurring. One of the scientists called upon was James Hansen, one of my other great heroes. And he explained that the cause of the heat waves was a build-up of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere uh, that was altering the heat balance at the surface of our planet. And that if this problem was allowed to go on, uh, it would threaten human survival. Attempts were made to deal with that problem in the same way that we dealt with the, with the Montreal Protocol with the CFCs. Uh, we had the Rio Earth Summit, then the Kyoto negotiations. But as of today, the problem simply continues to get worse. 2008 was the first year ever that 
emissions of carbon dioxide from human sources reached 10 billion tonnes. Been going up over time, now reached 10 billion tonnes. The rate of increase of concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere last year was 2.2%, up from 1.8% in the 1990s and towards 1% in the 1980s. So the problem is inevitably getting worse. There is a limited time to deal with this problem. We know that the climate system of the Earth can change very swiftly from one stable state to another. I'm a paleontologist by training, and I know that we divide up the geological time scale based on extinctions, what we call, in a very benign phrase, formal turnover. It's not terribly benign at all. It's when life is under threat, many species go extinct. We know that many of those periods of extinction were caused by a changing climate. And increasingly, we understand that these changes don't always occur over thousands or tens of thousands of years. Looking back on the ice core record from Greenland and the Antarctic, we can see that very dramatic changes in climate can, occur, can uh, occur over as little as a decade. And those sort, of, uh, those sort of changes are just profoundly dangerous to all life on Earth. So we need to limit the uh, concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere below a threshold that would trigger such dangerous climate change. In December this year, the nations of the world will once again come together, this time in Copenhagen, in Denmark, to try to agree on a global treaty that will seek to limit the concentration of those greenhouse gases below such a threshold.